Well, as we prayed, Pastor Dan and Linda are away on vacation, so we had to pull somebody back who we've had many, many years. So Doug Batchelder is with us this morning. Doug is uh, Dan's brother-in-law. So Doug, why don't you come on up and give us God's word this morning. All right. Thank you very much, Pastor. It is a delight to be with you again this morning. I said in the evening service, you know, when Greg asked everybody who are visitors to raise their hand. I thought, oh, do I raise mine or not? And I thought, no, 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 no. I'm not a visitor. I'm a regular attender. I come once a year. <laughs> Don't imitate me. <laughs> but um, I look forward to my time uh, here at Grace Calvary each summer and always glad when Dan sends me that email. Although, he, you know, it was a little later this springtime that he, you know, asked and I was you know, get my summer filled up. I'm hoping, you know, Dan, you're going to send me that email, and he did, so I'm just delighted to be with you today, and I just delight in having the opportunity to share the Word of God. I pastored for 35 years here in New Jersey, all in one church up in Warren County. Uh, before, four or five years ago, I joined TEAM, the Evangelical Alliance Mission. I serve in our Global Resources Group which means I work with major donors, primarily individuals, but also churches and foundations, in finding the resources needed to move the mission forward in 40 countries around the world where team ministers. God is doing some mighty, mighty things, and every single one of us can be part of that. Some by going, some by staying, some by giving, but all of us praying. So I'm hoping that you're engaged in some way in God's global work around the world. Uh, just very briefly, something exciting. You know, God is great and God is good. And he can stand before a tomb full of dead men's bones and command those bones to come to life, as he did outside of Lazarus' tomb in John chapter 11. And we take a look at the difficult things, the, the tragedy and the woes that our world just convulses through every day. And yet, you can see God's hand at work. We have missionaries in the western part of Ukraine. And um, about a year ago, when the conflict in the east became uh, uh, very heated, uh, one of our donors contacted me and said, Doug, you know, how is this affecting Denise, who is the missionary she supports? Uh, how's that affecting her? And I said, well, we haven't gotten any internal emails concerning anything significant, but I'll get in touch with her and see. So I did, and, and the word came back, well, at this point, not a whole lot of negative consequence other than the fact the price of electricity has tripled since the conflict began. And uh, so I kept in touch with her and communicated that back to this donor, and, and uh, soon word came that the church that uh, team missionaries had planted there in that area in the west was beginning to receive refugees from the east uh, because all the banks in the eastern conflict zone are closed uh, which means elderly people cannot get their pension money from the government other families can't get to their funds that if they even have them in a bank account businesses are closed uh, it's a very difficult situation and so the church imagine a church this size or smaller, beginning to have hundreds of people show up at the door looking for food to eat, diapers for their kids, a place to stay. So uh, I communicated that to this donor. This donor gave generously, and those funds were put into immediate use. And the church there is feeding 150 refugees twice a day, and every couple of weeks, sends a team of men with a van packed, towing a trailer, packed with food and supplies to the war zone and has been meeting the needs of 14 villages. And as a consequence of that, they are seeing a harvest of souls like they have not seen in decades of ministry in Ukraine. So what the wicked one intended to result in evil and destruction, God said, I can bring life out of death, light out of darkness. Isn't God great? Praise God. Amen. Turn, please, in your Bibles this morning to the eighth chapter of the Gospel of Mark. Mark is my favorite of the Gospels. 
Each gospel has its own flavor. Matthew writes to present us with Jesus as the king. Luke presents Jesus as the healer. John presents Jesus as the word that became flesh. And Mark presents Jesus as the servant. And he writes his gospel in a very rapid-fire manner. I describe Mark's gospel to others as though it were a, a well-cut, fast-action movie, because it kind of reads that way. Mark is kind of the Indiana Jones version, if you will, of uh, the life of Jesus Christ. And in order for us to understand the passage that we'll be looking at this morning, I'll take a moment to read it, we're going to spend a few minutes thinking our way through the Gospel of Mark to chapter 8 so that we have the full context of what God is doing. But verse 27, Mark chapter 8 is where we'll start. And Jesus went out with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way he questioned his disciples, saying to them, Who do people say that I am? And they told him, saying, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, but others one of the prophets. And he continued by questioning them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said to him, Thou art the Christ. And he warned them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he was stating the matter plainly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning around and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests but man's. And he summoned the multitude with his disciples and said to them, If anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life shall lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels shall save it. For what does it profit a man if he gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Now, to get the full impact of what's transpiring here, we have to think our way as to what has transpired so far in the Gospel of Mark. In Mark chapter 1, we have Jesus beginning to call people to follow him. He comes to Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, who were fishermen, there they were by their boats, and Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I'll make you become fishers of men. And in chapter 1, he begins to teach with authority. He begins to demonstrate his authority by casting out demons. He begins to heal illnesses no one knew what to do with. In chapter 2, he forgives the sins of a paralyzed man. And in forgiving sins, he creates conflict between himself and the religious power people of the day who did not like nor receive his message. He calls more to follow him. In Mark chapter 3, he heals on the Sabbath. And that creates conflict with the religious leaders as well because they had layered on top of God's law, the Mosaic law, their own version of what was really easier for them to keep than keep the real commands that God had given to them. And they were upset that Jesus was upsetting their power. So Jesus demonstrates his power and unclean spirits confess that he's the Son of God. Interesting. The Pharisees wouldn't say that, but the demons would. He appoints the twelve. He not only wants them to follow him, but he wants them to go out and proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God. And they do so. In chapter 4, he teaches in parables the parable of the soils and the reality of the kingdom of God. In chapter 4, he stills the storm. His disciples, there they were in the boat. The seas get rough. It's dark. It's difficult. They are afraid. Not that any of us go through dark or difficult times that make us afraid. So they wake Jesus up, who is sleeping in the back of the boat. I just love the picture. And they say to him, Lord, don't you care that we are perishing? What a thing to say to Jesus Christ, who left the glory of heaven to come here to rescue us who are perishing, to say to him, don't you care that we're dying? He wouldn't have been in that boat unless he cared. And he rebukes them 
for their lack of faith. We come to chapter 5, and the miracles there are just nothing less than stunning. He delivers a man from being possessed of demons and commands the demons to go into a flock of pigs who then run and commit suicide by running off a cliff into the sea. Incidentally, that miracle probably upset the whole economy of that town. He heals a woman of her hemorrhage. He raises a little girl from the dead. And now you must reckon with who Jesus is because he's changing everything. You come to chapter 6. Jesus goes to his hometown. You would think that there they would receive him gladly. There they rejected him utterly. Their unbelief is breathtaking. Jesus sends the 12 out, this time with no resources whatsoever other than to trust God for their basic needs. And they minister powerfully. They come back from that all excited, saying, you know, Lord, even the demons were subject to us. And a quick reality check happens instantly after that when John the Baptist is beheaded and becomes a martyr. Suddenly, the disciples are beginning to get a little inkling of the fact that following Jesus isn't all miracles. He feeds the 5,000. He walks on the water. And the hard heart of the disciples was revealed. You know, the interesting thing is, not that Jesus walked on water. He's God. He could do that. It's not even unbelievable that Peter would walk on water with Jesus because Jesus said, Peter, come on out here with me. And Peter, understanding who Jesus is at that point, climbs out of the boat and walks to Jesus. And as long as he looks at Jesus, things are fine. And when he begins to look at circumstances, he begins to drown. And you know, the same is true for us. No, it's not amazing that Jesus could walk on water or that he can make Peter walk on water. What's amazing is, is that the other 11 guys stayed in the boat. Because if we really believe that Jesus is who he is, we will follow him even if he asks us to climb out of the boat and walk on water with him. Chapter 7. The evil heart of the religious leaders is revealed yet even more. And so Jesus takes his message to the Gentiles and redeems a little girl possessed of demons. In Mark chapter 8, he feeds the 4,000. He has more conflict with the Pharisees. He heals a blind man. The imagery and the symbolism is powerful. And when all of this has happened, when we've come through all of these experiences, we come to chapter 8, where they're walking along the way, and Jesus turns to his disciples and he says, who do people say that I am? That is a defining question. And he gets the range of answers that you normally get when you ask people who Jesus is. You know, some say, well, Jesus, some people think that you're John the Baptist who came back from the dead. But he's not. Doesn't dress like him. Doesn't eat bugs and honey. Now, I've eaten bugs. They're not too bad. I would, ate bugs, ate crickets when I was in Chad a year ago. People say, ooh, you know, aren't they crunchy? They are. <laughs> no, what do they taste like? Well, the best way I can describe them is they taste like stale Doritos. Now, I happen to like stale Doritos, so I asked for seconds and thirds. But, um, so he's not John the Baptist, that's clear. Some people say, well, he must be Elijah. Elijah was a powerful prophet. I mean, he could call down fire from heaven. I mean, he, was, he was mighty. Not Elijah. And others said, well, he must be one of the other prophets from the Old Testament times. And then Jesus asked them, who do you think I am? And that question still needs to be asked every day of every person. 
You see, if you just think that Jesus is a great prophet, if you just think that Jesus is a good example, if you just think that Jesus is a great teacher, that's fine and wonderful, but you know something? That Jesus isn't going to save you from your sin. Because that means he's a human being just like every other human being. Because every one of the prophets, including Elijah, including John the Baptist, including all of the writers of the Old Testament, they were all sinners in need of God's redeeming grace. So if Jesus was just another prophet, he can't be our Savior. But if he is the word that became flesh and dwelt among us so we could behold his glory, if he is the perfect Lamb of God who can take away the sin of the world, if he is God made man and perfect, then he's the only one anywhere, anytime, in any way who can save us from our sin. When you have an opportunity to talk to somebody concerning their spiritual condition, a great question to ask is who do you think Jesus is? And Jesus asked that question of his disciples. Why? Because being a follower of Jesus requires that you believe that he is God. Jesus himself said, unless you believe that I am, he uses the Old Testament term for God, the self-existent one, you will die in your sins. But it's not just an issue of salvation. It's an issue of discipleship, too. You see, if we really believe that Jesus is God, why would we not obey him when he asks us to do something? Why would we not let him guide us? Because he's the one who knows the end from the beginning. Why is it we would not let him change us from the inside out so that we look and act and live as he did in this world? You see, we cannot be a follower of Jesus unless we really believe that he is God made flesh. Secondly, as we think about what it means to be a genuine follower of Jesus, is to understand what the interchange between Jesus and Peter is next. You know, he says, who do people say that I am? They said, well, a prophet. Well, who do you say that I am? Peter says, you're the Christ. And Jesus said, don't tell anybody. What? Well, you have to understand, in the context of the day, what everybody was looking for was a Messiah to deliver them from Roman rule. And that was the limit of it. And that, I think, is what Peter is having in mind here. Jesus said, don't tell anybody that I'm just the Messiah, because he's also the Savior, the Savior from our sin. And he explained very bluntly and very plainly that the Son of Man was going to have to die, be buried, and rise again. And Peter takes Jesus aside and said, Jesus, you got to stop talking that way. Now, why would Peter say that? Well, think about the whole flow of what we know from the Gospels about the disciples. Even after Jesus called them to follow him, they fought among themselves as to who was going to be the most important. And Peter has in his head, Peter, prime minister of the kingdom. <laughs> and if Jesus dies, guess what? There goes his promotion. So he says to Jesus, don't talk that way. And what does Jesus say to Peter? It's stunning. He says to one of his disciples, get behind me, Satan. He calls him Satan. You know, the word Satan simply means adversary. And now it makes sense. Because Jesus goes on to explain 
Peter, I want you, you can actually translate it, get in line. Get back in line with truth. Because if you're not in line with God's truth, you're in an adversarial relationship with God and his purposes here in this world. He said, Peter, your problem is you're setting your mind on man's interests, not on God's interests. You see, one can hang around Jesus, even claim to be a follower of Jesus, but be playing for the wrong side. When I was in high school, our church had a Word of Life Bible Club, and every winter we had a basketball tournament. Now, I'm six feet tall. I was six feet tall in high school. And so everybody thought, you know, I ought to be a good basketball player, but I'm not. <laughs> but I was really enthusiastic. But being enthusiastic when you're wrong just doesn't get you there. I did actually score a basket <laughs> for the wrong team. <laughs> See, I thought I was doing okay. I was enthusiastic. I thought I was right. And I scored for the wrong team. And that's Peter. Enthusiastic. Thought he was right but playing for the wrong team. Is that your case? Jesus brought Peter right up short and said, Peter, here's your problem. Your life is organized around what's important to mankind. When if we are followers of Jesus, our life will be organized around what's important to God. And there's no way around that. You can't make it out of verse 33 with any other conclusion. If we're going to be followers of Jesus, then we have to be intentional, purposeful, and constant in focusing our lives upon what's important to God, not what is important to ourselves. That's hard. Doing it any other way makes us an adversary. So let me ask you, what sets your priorities? What determines your attitudes? What shapes your plans? What shows up in your checkbook by way of what's really important? Would Jesus have to say to you or me, get in line with truth? Otherwise, you're an adversary. You can't be a follower of Jesus and organize your life by your own priorities. You say, but it's my life. Beg your pardon? What does the word redeemed mean? There are two words in the New Testament used for redeem. One is the word garazzo. It means to buy. As if you were to walk into a market, pay money, and walk out with a dozen eggs. The other is a word which would be used to describe the purchase of a slave. It's ex agorazzo. And it means to buy and then remove from the marketplace never to be sold again. Both words legitimately are translated redeemed. When Jesus Christ redeemed us, he bought the rights to our life. He didn't just buy our sin, though he did that, praise God. He bought our breath, our energy, our talents, 
our time, our past, our present, our future, our priorities, our expectations, our hopes are His. That's why he can legitimately say, you belong to me. That's why he can legitimately say, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. It's not an unreasonable demand. In fact, Paul says, it is reasonable. It's our reasonable service. How do you know if you're setting your mind on God's interests rather than man's? Well, I think it shows up in a variety of different ways in our life. When we set our mind on those things that are important to God rather than those things that are important to us, then we will seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You see, it's not just seeking the kingdom. You know, because in the kingdom, you're safe. In the kingdom, you're provided for. In the kingdom, you're secure. But Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You see, that means we begin to order our life according to the priorities of the king of that kingdom. We prayed this morning, thy kingdom come on earth, as it is in heaven. And that works its way out by our living justly in Micah 6-8 terms. He showed you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to live justly, love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. The perfect recipe for a kingdom life. No, you can't be a follower of Jesus and let a human mindset control your decisions and your priorities. Third, follows hard on the heels of that. Take a look at that text. Verse 34, he summoned the multitude with his disciples and said to them, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Oh my goodness. Here's where it gets hard. What does it mean to deny ourself? Well, we already talked about setting our interests on God's things rather than our own. That's step one. In order to do that well, we really have to deny ourselves. This word deny oneself in Greek is arneomai. It occurs in such a way that it's called a middle voice, that this is an action that one must do to oneself by oneself, for oneself. In other words, that word, written the way it is in Scripture, means I can't deny yourself in your life. You can't deny myself in my life. We're each responsible to deny self in our own life. In other words, I can't live your spiritual life for you. You can't live my spiritual life for me. We are each individually responsible and accountable to make the right choices about how we live our life. It's not the job of the pastor to keep your soul in line. It's not the job of the pastor to set your priorities about how you use your time, whether you use your talents for the sake of the kingdom. It's not the church board's job to teach you what to how to, to make the decisions in your life that you need to make. Those are your responsibilities. They are my responsibilities individually. And Jesus says, if you are going to follow me, you're going to have to deny yourself. You see, all of us have this movie script that we've written for our life, and we play it in our head a lot, don't we? All right, this scene... It's kind of okay, but the next scene's going to be a lot better. I'm going to be healthier, wealthier, and wiser. And then it doesn't happen. Don't you hate it when that happens? 
Not only does it not happen, sometimes the opposite happens. We encounter illness and sorrow and grief and pain. We say to God, how come you're not cooperating with my plan? I actually have had people say that in so many words. I now come into church because I'm mad at God. I'm mad at God for fill in the blank. I'm not going to pray. I'm not going to serve. I tell God what I think of him. I've had people actually say those sorts of things. See, their heart is set on man's interests, not God's interests. Think about Mary and Martha when Jesus showed up when Lazarus is in the tomb. They go to him and said, Lord, if you had been here, our brother would not have died. And there's the frank frustration of those two sisters who love their brother. Translation, Lord, you blew it. Jesus said, come here. Where is he? He's in the tomb. Roll away the stone. If you want to do that, it's been four days. No refrigeration. <laughs> Roll it. Lazarus, come forth. And death had no option but to let go. Mary and Martha's movie script was Lazarus gets sick, Jesus shows up, and Lazarus is well. God's script is Lazarus gets sick, Lazarus dies, Lazarus decays, everything looks hopeless, and then Jesus calls life out of death. Hey, which was the better outcome? Denying oneself says to God, your script is better than mine. Denying oneself says, I no longer am going to associate with that old person who only organized life based upon what's important on earth. Power, pleasure, money, possessions. Instead, I'm going to set my interest on the things that are above. That requires denying one's self. Another way of translating that is that we must lose sight of our own interests. Isn't that interesting? He had just, Jesus had just told Peter, your interests are man's only, your interests are not God's. And now he says, you must deny yourself. You must lose sight of your own interest. None of us like to do that because we're born selfish. Our selfish switch when we're born is stuck in the on position. And it stays stuck that way for everybody till they die. Unless... We let Jesus change it. None of us can change the switch ourselves. We need to be made new. But having been made new, we still now and then struggle with going back to that switch and pushing it back to on. Denying oneself is intentional, purposed, and consistent decisions that it's God first, others second, and self last. It's that simple and that hard. <clears throat> Lastly, 
Following Jesus requires that we believe that he is God. Following Jesus requires a mindset on God's interests rather than our own. Following Jesus requires that we deny ourselves. And following Jesus requires, there it is, the end of verse 34, to take up his cross and follow him. Now, this phrase, take up one's cross, I think is one of the most misunderstood phrases in the entire New Testament. You know, I've been part of conversations where, you know, someone who's going through some long-term difficulty, a chronic illness or a difficult child or a difficult spouse or whatever, uh, some kind of struggle in terms of a business that just isn't going well, and, you know, people kind of throw up their hands and say, well, that's just the cross they have to bear. No, it's not. Is it hard? Yes. Is it the cross that Jesus is talking about here? No. You see, we read this phrase, take up your cross, from the perspective of what it means to us. But the cross was a place that did something for us in as much as Jesus died for us. And indeed, that was a painful process. But think of it from the perspective of Jesus. What was the cross to him? The cross was that point in time where God's plan to redeem us was put into motion. It is the moment for which he was born. His death on the cross was the reason he lived. It was his mission. That's the point for you and me. Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, then find out your mission that he has given you and do it as priority one. No matter where it takes you, no matter what it costs, No matter whether other people respond well or not, our mission, as his was, was to bring God's grace to the lives of people. And that's the cross we're to bear. To embrace the mission of bringing the grace of God to the lives of people. Is that what is consciously on our mind every day? When we wake up in the morning, Do we say, Lord, help me, everybody that I meet, starting with your spouse and your kids or your mom and dad, I'm going to bring grace to their life so that they can see Jesus. You go to work and there's your boss who showed up again. (laughs) I'm going to bring grace to my boss's life. The person who cuts you off in the Garden State Parkway. Okay, they don't qualify. No, I'm going to bring grace to the other drivers on the road. I'm going to bring grace to the person who's my checkout clerk at at Walmart rather than say, I have been waiting in line for 15 minutes to buy my Band-Aids. The mission is deliver God's grace to those who need it. Are you a follower of Jesus? Do you really believe he's God? Are you a follower of Jesus? Have you set your mind on God's things? Are you a follower of Jesus? Have you set aside your own interests? Are you a follower of Jesus? By making it a priority to be a person of grace and to bring that grace to as many as you possibly can before God takes you home. That is what it means to follow Jesus. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that it's point blank blunt. So we can never say to you, I didn't get it. I I didn't understand. This is not difficult to understand. It is difficult to do because we still have a sin nature that wants to assert itself 
and say, my kingdom come, not yours. Help us to be people of grace and to lavish it on others as you have lavished it on us. In Jesus' name, amen.